A very good evening to you, Brumley Baptist Church. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study for today. We are back in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 18, and we're going to be talking about the new covenant tonight. Last week, we started this discussion of the New Covenant, and we actually didn't get too far into the text here in Corinthians, and that was mostly because we took a look backward at a passage in Hebrews um, that really dealt with the concept of the New Covenant. We were in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, and we made note just some discussion about what the New Covenant was. Uh, Paul mentions it here in 2 Corinthians and uh, does teach about it and some of its value, but he doesn't go into detail on exactly what it is. And so I felt it was important last week for us to go and kind of pick that up a little bit about exactly what the new covenant was and how it related to us. And then today we're going to start our first of two kind of deep dives into the text itself here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and see what the new covenant is all about. Um, we said last week that it comes from God, that it's eternal, that it's not legalistic, and Paul's going to echo some of those ideas, um, but I really want to get into exactly what he says. So let's start with reading scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 6. Um, Paul says, who made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look directly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? That's what he says there. Verse 9, for if the ministry of condemnation has glory, how much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory? And we'll pick up there here in just a few minutes. This is a beautiful passage, and so much of what I love about it uh, is the descriptor of how much better we have it as ministers and partakers of this brand new covenant. That's a beautiful thing that we have here in our New Testament relationship with Christ, that we have been saved, and now we have this opportunity to uh, be even more uh, involved in who he is, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so we, we want to, again, fill that as much as we can. We want to have as much knowledge as we can about the new covenant and about who Jesus is and about what he has done for us because of that. And so 2 Corinthians 3 is our, our passage to, to really do that, okay? And so we will break this up into two weeks. Today we'll start um, with just the first uh, three or four verses, and then we'll, we'll go into the rest of the verses probably next Wednesday night. We're going to finish chapter three with this same idea of what is the new covenant. So let's get some ideas what the new covenant is and what it looks like. And the first thing I would give you is, is just this idea that the new covenant gives life. It gives life. Look at verse six, who made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, um, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Uh, the King James says, who also hath made us able ministers of the new Testament or covenant. Um, this idea that we have something better is, is the number one thing. So the old covenant, we have to go back and think about it. Where is it? Well, it, it comes on Mount Sinai. It's given to Moses in the form of the Ten Commandments initially, and then the rest of the law given directly to the people by God. And, and they, the law was good. It told them how to live. It told them what, what they should do and what they should not do. It told them things to strive for, and it told them things to also stay away from. And so it, it was there, and it was valuable, and it had a great deal of value. But now, he says, we got something better. Uh, we got something that is far beyond that, and he has made us adequate as, as ministers or sufficient as ministers. I mean, he's given us an opportunity to do something better. Most of the Jewish folks that Paul was writing to had believed a misrepresentation of why God gave the law. And, and we need to know why God gave the law. Was he just trying to, to keep them from having fun? Was he trying to keep them from enjoying life? What was God's purpose in giving the law to the people? Uh, it wasn't a way of salvation. 
Uh, in fact, in Romans 3.20, he says the law came in so that the, so that the transgression would increase. See, all of a sudden, when you know what's right and wrong, you realize when you're doing wrong things. And so the law doesn't save you. It actually kills you. Why? Because it tells you how you've messed this up. You've messed that up. You've lied. You've stolen. You've, you know, you've done all these things. And before the law existed, you wouldn't have known those things were wrong. The law is the dividing line that told you they were wrong. So, so the old covenant kills. And it kills in at least three ways here that I want to emphasize. Number one, it kills joy, peace, and hope and replaces those things with frustration, sorrow, hopelessness, and guilt. Okay, so if I tell you the law, it, it doesn't bring you joy, it brings you guilt. It doesn't bring you peace that you're in a right standing with God. It reminds you that you've broken God's law and you're at, at, at odds with him. Okay, so if I say God said don't lie, we would all agree, boy, yeah, we should not lie. God is the God of truth. We shouldn't tell a lie. Okay, how many of you that are listening right now have ever told a lie? Every single one of us. Well, the law says you're now a transgressor, you're guilty, and you are separated from God, even if you're sorry, even if you apologize. Why? Because you've broken that law, and that punishment from God has to flow from a perfect, righteous God to somewhere. So even if you don't like that you did it, you still committed the crime. Uh, our modern expression was you do the crime, you do the time, right? So it kills joy, peace, and hope because it never allows you to rest. It never allows you to just be in a relationship with God the Father because you're not worthy of it because of your transgression. Second, it kills because your inability to keep the law perpetrates spiritual death. Galatians says you are dead in your sins. Romans says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing you can do to fix that. Romans 6.23 says that you are separated from God because of that. Ephesians chapter 2, excuse me, says you are dead in your sins and transgressions. Dead people don't do anything. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. You've earned your wages because you've sinned and I've sinned. And so it just keeps you in this state. Once you're dead, you're dead. And then finally, the violated law becomes the basis of condemnation. So if you get the law and you know, okay, now I shouldn't lie. That's a good thing to know not to lie. The problem is once you know not to lie, you realize you have already done it. And now you can't keep from ever, you can't fix it. You can't change it because you've done it. You've broken it. You can't, if you murder someone, you can't unkill them. Well, you can't unsin. Once you've sinned, you've broken the law. You've transgressed the law. And so if we go back to what Corinthians says here in verse six, He's made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter of the law says, don't lie. And if you've ever lied, you're separated from God. But the spirit of the law says, be someone who speaks truth. So if you're going by the letter of the law, you're dead because you've broken it. But if you go by the spirit of the law, now this new covenant allows you to be a person who lives in truth. It's a new understanding of God's covenant, a new way to now live within his covenant. Not, not that you've not ever broken it because you have, but now you're going to live differently because you have the ability to live a life of truth now and not one of falsehood anymore. So the law kills, but the spirit gives life. So that's the first thing about the new covenant. It gives life. Number two, the new covenant produces righteousness. Verse seven. The ministry, he says, but if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face. Go and you skip down to verse eight, nine. How will the ministry of the spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Uh, the phrase, but if, could actually be better translated since, since the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones, okay? So that's what we have going on here. Um, the Ten Commandments were the moral summary of God's law written on stone tablets, engraved on stones, and it came with a tremendous amount of glory. Go back and read Exodus 20. The mountain was shaking. The smoke was there. The people were terrified of this holy, majestic God. 
when Moses came down, his face was aglow because he had been there with God. It says they couldn't even look at him, even though that glory was fading off of his face. He had simply been there. And so it was an incredible, incredible experience. Um, now, the issue here is in the last part of this verse. It says that it is a ministry, or excuse me, the very first part of this phrase, not the verse, but if the ministry of death, since the ministry of death, okay, it was glorious. The mountain was shaking. There was thunder. There was lightning. There was the glory on Moses' face. And guess what? That was still a ministry of death because God had given them the law. And even as Moses brought the law to them, they were being separated from God because each and every one of them had disobeyed that law. They had broken God's standard. Paul writes in Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be, he says. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. I would not have known about coveting if the law had said you shall not covet. Our depraved human mind couldn't even understand God's holy law unless he gave it to us. So this is really important, okay? Old Testament saints were not saved by keeping the law, but by being broken over their inability to keep the law. If you can get saved by keeping the law, then Jesus becomes unnecessary. Dear friend, and there's never a theology that sees Jesus Christ as unnecessary. Not an accurate theology, anyway. They, they couldn't keep the law and be saved. What they could do is realize how sinful and separated they were because they could not keep the law. And when they realized they could not keep the law, they began to look to God for a way of salvation. And that's why every Old Testament book gives the continuous idea one day Messiah will come, one day Messiah will come, one day Messiah will come. See the difference there? It's a really important distinction. It's a really important difference. And so that, that's what's going on here. This is a ministry of death. But even in spite of that, what did the psalmist say over and over again? Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation day and night. Even though they knew the law was death, they loved it. The point being, how much more should we love God's law since the covenant he gives us brings life? Their covenant brought them death, and they still said how much they loved the law of God because it was a reflection of him. Oh, but how beautiful was it? Because it still showed who God was, even though it brought them death. Psalm said it was more desirable than gold, sweeter than honey. Psalm 19, verse 10. It wasn't their attitude toward the law that saved them. Rather, salvation changed their attitude toward God's law. Apart from Christ, the Old Testament was a ministry of condemnation, ministry of death. Now, we have to remember who's writing this. This is the Apostle Paul, right? If anybody was a staunch defender of the law, it would have been him. According to Philippians, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. He was zealous for the law. He was righteous. He was found blameless. It's all Philippians 3, 5, and 6. Outwardly, he led a blameless, righteous life. But when he met Jesus face to face on the Damascus Road, all of those things in verses 5 and 6 from Philippians 3, what does he say in verse 7? They were all lost compared to Christ. He called them rubbish, garbage. Not his own righteousness, but he called everything garbage when it was compared with knowing Jesus. He's really just saying the same thing here. He's saying the same thing here, that this new thing produces righteousness. And if, it, if the old had glory of God and Moses' face and all those things, in spite of how it was, how much better is this new covenant? Because it brings righteousness and grace and not the condemnation of the law. It's really a beautiful, beautiful picture. And so it produces righteousness. It gives us life, and it produces righteousness. And the last thing today that we'll say, and we'll, we'll dive further into this next week, is that the new covenant is permanent. At the end of verse 7, he mentions this phrase, fading as it was. Okay? And then jump down to verse 10. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, how much more that which remains is in glory. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, and, and he had to veil his face. The Bible says that they couldn't even look directly at him because he had been with God. 
and simply the fact that he had been with God, his face was shining so brightly they couldn't look at it, even though it was fading by that time. Because he was coming down the mountain, and the whole time he was coming down, it was getting, it was fading and fading and fading. And that is such a symbolic picture of what the law does. Literally, from the very moment that God gave the law on the tablets, the significance of those laws began to fade because it got closer and closer and closer to the coming of Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And so it symbolized the impermanence of the old covenant. It was not intended to be forever, and it was not intended to save. It was a type and a shadow of Jesus coming. Through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, God promised a new covenant, and that was quoted verbatim in Hebrews, and that's why I went back and looked at that scripture, because it was really important to establish that this new covenant was something that had been planned for since literally the very giving of the first covenant. And so God knew what he was going to do. When he made a new covenant, the first one was obsolete. It was growing old. It was fading, just as Moses' face was fading. Again, it's very symbolic. For what had glory, in this case, has no glory. Why? Because there's something brighter. If you have a small candle and then you have a giant spotlight, well, first, if you just light the candle, you'll see the light, right? But if you turn the giant spotlight on, the candle will seem to disappear. The light from the candle will disappear. Now, it's still there. It didn't, it didn't go away, but it just got overwhelmed and overshadowed by the giant spotlight. And so the old covenant was short-term small light, and then when the new covenant comes, it just completely overwhelms it. Uh, Paul wrote here, the, the what had glory, the old covenant, in this case, has no glory because of the glory of the new covenant that surpasses it. The old one is fading away, was burning out, and when this new one shows up, it just completely overwhelmed it. So we can know, church, we can know believers in Christ, that our relationship with Jesus is permanent because our covenant with Jesus is permanent. And that's a wonderful thing. We never have to wonder if we've done enough or if we're in relationship with Christ or if we've obeyed enough, if he loves us enough. No, the covenant says you are mine forever because you've been bought with a price. And that price is the precious blood of Jesus. So the new covenant is completely permanent. It lasts forever. And we will never, never have to wonder if we're part of the family of God. Dear friend, that is a beautiful, beautiful promise for all of us. And it's that promise that I'll leave you with today. Have a good and godly day and go serve.